Unit 5 The General Prologue to the Canterbed True Tales Structure 5.0 Objectives 5.1 Introduction 5.2 The Opening Section of the Prologue 5.3 The Portraits 5.4 The Concluding Section of the Prologue 5.5 Letusimup 5.6 Exercises 5.0 Objectives our aim in this unit is to examine closely the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales, since the previous two units have introduced you to the age of Chaucer, and to a general survey of the poetry of Chaucer and his contemporaries. The paraphrase and annotation in this unit will sensitize you to the skill and characterization, social commentary and ironic tone of Chaucer. 5.1 Introduction This unit will introduce you to the portraits which are individuals as well as social types. You will also be given an idea of Chaucer's irony and his use of the narrator. 5.3 The opening section of the prologue. The general prologue begins with a memorable description of spring. The immediate reason for this is that only with the return of mild weather after winter could people go on a pilgrimage. Many passages have been suggested as possible sources. Chaucer was clearly dealing with a conventional theme with commonplace feet tilde tilde res. Such conventionality was not a weakness, but a strength in medieval literature. People in Chaucer's time passed winter inside dark, draughty, badly heated, smoky huts living on salted beef, smoked bacon, dried peas, beans, last year's wheat or rye and so on. The shortage of fish food resulted in diseases like scurvy in winter. Thus when the April showers made the grass grow again, both cattle and men were delighted at the prospect of fresh food and recovery of health. The sweet showers revive nature, and by implication human nature, the underlying motif is of resurrection or spiritual renewal. This is the way in which the cycle of seasons is closely related to the cycle of human life. April provides material occasion and spiritual yearning for going on pilgrimage. The force of rejuvenating nature is in the south wind which inspires or breathes upon the tender twigs to make them grow. It bathes every vein, that is, the earth and the vessels of sap. It spurs even the small birds to sing all night. The biological awakening passes easily into spiritual kist, the desire to journey out of drab, everyday existence to distant holy shrines. The pilgrims come from all corners of England to visit the shrine of St. Thomas I.E. Beckett who was martyred in the Canterbury Cathedral in 1170. The modem poet, T.S. Eliot, wrote a play, Murder in the Cathedral, on this event. Eliot's waist and also opens with an ironic echo of Chaucer. April is the cruelest month. Chaucer habitually refers to time in the framework of astrology or mythology. He tells us here that the sun is in the early part of its annual course, just coming out of Aries, the first sign of the zodiac. This is how astrology, WL tilde itch also meant astronomy, links earthly life to the heavenly. The sign of the inn, where Chaucer the narrator is joined by the twenty-nine pilgrims was a tabard or short sleeveless coat, embroidered with armorial bearings. The fellowship of pilgrims suggests a sense of community, and their varied backgrounds make the description a miniature version of 14th century society. 5. 3. The Portraits The first portrait of the knight is an idealized one, a type of chivalry, gentle in speech and manner, gallant in battles and tournaments, dignified and simple in his soiled rough tunic and coat of mail. There is perhaps a very light touch of irony in his maiden-like shy manner, and his lack of gaiety or liveliness. Perhaps these last two details individualize him. He seems a bit out of place in the age of declining chivalry. His military campaigns are all actual crusades, although he could have fought also in the Hundred Years' War. In the Mediterranean and North Africa he fought till died against the Moors and Saracens. He heads the table of honor of the Teutonic Knights because of his campaigns against heathen tribes in Prussia, Lithuania, and Russia. In contrast to his Christian motives, his son, the squire, seems to have joined the company for pleasure. He is a young courtly lover, an aspirant to knighthood, whose chivalric prowess has already brought him much honor. Apart 50111 his handsome physique, many more details of his costume and appearance are given. I.I.S. locks were curled, and his gown embroidered like a spring meadow. Fazl's inable dress was denounced by parish priests as a waste of money that could have gone to the poor. His fresh and youthful energy is further brought out in his sleepless love, and his ability to sing, dance, draw, write, Jost and Coinpus songs anticipates the type of the Renaissance courtier. The knight's yeoman ranked in service just above the groom. 
Later, Yeoman came to mean small substantial landholders. His green dress, his horn and the talisman image of St. Christopher, patron saint of foresters and travelers, show that he was a gamekeeper by profession. Chaucer held the post of deputy forester in the Royal Forest of North Peterton for over seven years. Individual details include his classic crooked head and sunburned face as well as the panache with which H.C. carried his weapons. The bow, midi bow could meal the long bow, and arrows, and guard, of archery, sword, shield and dagger suggest that he may have been among the yeoman archers and knifemen who routed French chivalry at Kirksai. The character of the prioress is very subtly drawn, with due respect to her social rank. It was more than likely that she came from an upper-class family. Women fro 111 the peasant or artisan classes were easily married because of the dowry they brought of labor. For the nobility, dowry meant money or family connection. But the nanny knights were impoverished, and THEI tilde unmarried daughters had to take refuge in the nunnery, where they often spent a life of material comfort and spiritual contentment since virginity was much admired in the Middle Ages. Thus Cha Tilda Tilda Sir's prioress was well-bred but in her eagerness to imitate courtly manners given low vanities and foibles. The church expressly forbade her to go on a pilgrimage, which meant coming out of cloistered life, and to possess pets, since the money needed for their upkeep could be used for the poor. Prologue Tire medieval poet against this social situation, Chaucer describes her beauty, dress and dainty table clients her manners in the style of the ordinances even her name and adjectives like simple and coy fit in. She is given to swearing, though only by Saint Eligius, who was also a type of social aspiration. The tales of her sensuous mouth, delicate nose and unveiled, broad forehead, her dress and jewels, fluted wimple, ornamental rosary and the brooch, suggest a femininity imperfectly suppressed by her holy vows. Chaucer's gentle irony at her elkin manners is extended to her skill in the nasal intonation traditionally used in the recitative portions of the church service. Her French is also gently satirized since it betrays her aspiration to courtliness. Her French could not be that of Paris, but was rather what she could pick up in an English nunnery. But Chaucer does bring out some laxities in her conduct. Not only did she keep pet dogs against the rules, but fed them roasted meat, milk, and wastel bread, an expensive white bread, food that would not be available to most people in England. This moral apathy is deepened by the false delicacy of her sentimental charity. She was so tender of conscience that she would weep to see her pets beaten or dead. She would also weep to see mice trapped, but mice were after all dangerous pests, perhaps even carriers of the plague. The tongue-in-cheek manner continues till the end. Modeled on the heroine of courtly romance, Madame Eglantine wears a brooch whose motto of conquers all could mean carnal or divine love. The monk usually came of the gentry, or noble class since education was expensive, and monks had to be learned. The rules of the monastic order were initially laid down by St. Augustine, c. 400 A.D., and then by St. Benedict, c. 700 A.D., the monks had to follow the principles of obedience, poverty and celibacy, perform manual labor or pursue the life of a scholar or teacher, and generally spend an abstemious life within the cloister. Their daily activities included praying and glorifying God, giving alms to the poor and copying manuscripts. As the wealth and administrative duties of the monastery increased, the monks fell into luxury. The outrider monks had to supervise the estates and cells or subordinate monasteries, and therefore could not remain cloistered. Chaucer's monk, Don Pierce, is identified with the new world of wealth, luxury and pleasure. He contemptuously dismisses the Augustinian ideal of asceticism, renunciation of the world and cloistered learning. Chaucer's attitude is once again ambiguous. He neither entirely approves nor condemns. Certainly the monk's vitality and healthy appetite for life suggest an opening up of the medieval world, a major social and ideological change. His love of hunting is not untypical, although physical details, foppish clothes and the bells in his horse's bridle serve to individualize him. In a sense all his defiant and amoral energy is concentrated in his eyes indicating a psychological and social tendency. The friars had to take the vow of poverty, follow the teachings of Christ, perform good deeds, and preach all around the country. In Chaucer's time, there were four major orders of friars in England. The Dominicans, or Black Friars, the Franciscans, or Grey Friars, the Carmelites, or White Friars and the Augustinians, or Austin Friars. They were mendicant orders surviving through begging. 
Soon, however, begging became a flourishing business and begging rights in specified districts were being vied for by the friars. Since they could collect ecclesiastical taxes and hear I confessions, they made a lot of money. In other words, Chaucer's friar, Hubert, is an example of the corruption of the mendicant orders much attacked by the followers of Wycliffe. He is a limiter, that is, licensed to beg within a certain limit, but his income far exceeded what he turned into the convent. His soft white neck and habit of lisping are signs of lechery. With the help of gifts and trinkets, latest songs and blessing of houses, by singing in Principio, the opening verses of St. John's Gospel, H.E. seduced women and later found husbands and dowries for them. Playing on the piety of people, he shunned the poor and the sick, eloquenting taverns and the houses of the rich, where he put on an obsequious attitude. After all, as Chaucer puts it ironically, people should donate money to the poor friars, while it was neither respectable nor profitable for the latter to deal with the poor. Forbidden to meddle in civil affairs, the friars nevertheless took an active part on love days, that is, on days appointed for settlement of disputes out of court. On such occasions they were opulently dressed. Like the monk, the friar also expresses a new kind of power through his eyes. The merchant represents a very rich and powerful class in England. There were two powerful groups of merchants. The merchant adventurers who imported English cloth into foreign cities, and the merchants of the staple, who lived at home and exported English wool abroad. Although his general appearance suggested the confidence of wealth, the merchant was actually in debt, but maintained his financial reputation and credit by forever boasting about profits and bargains. He is quite fashionable, witness his neatly clasped boots and forked beard puts on expensive, though somewhat conservative clothes and his beaver hat links him to the Flemish trade. Middleburg was the foreign headquarters of the merchant adventurers and the English port, Orwell, was used by the merchants of the staple. Perhaps Chaucer's merchant belonged to both groups. He was secretly involved in two major economic crimes, usury and illegal dealing in foreign exchange. Chaucer's clerk is a university student preparing for a career in the church. In contrast to the many licentious clerks, L one's the portrait of the scholar whose unworldliness kept him poor. Both H.T. and his horse were emaciated, and his clothes were threadbare. He has applet. I. Himself to the study of logic, the backbone of medieval university education. He was thus happier to have at his bedside twenty volumes of Aristotle whose influence on medieval academic life was pervasive than the luxuries of life. Historians tell us that at that time twenty books, produced no doubt entirely by hand, would have cost the equivalent of two or three burghers' houses. It is not surprising then that all his expenditure was on books. Chaucer puns on the word philosopher, which also Merle alchemist, when he says that the clerk three philosophy did not give him gold. Needing the charity of benefactors, he tried to repay them by prayers for their souls. He never laid on seemly levity in behavior, and was always brief, to the point and morally educative in his speech. The sergeant of the law was one of the king's legal servants, chosen from barristers of 16 years standing. The judges of the Kerr, S.C. Tilda Clarissa and T.H., chief baron of the exchequer also came from their ranks. Chaucer's portrait has a speed colon dot I'll interest because of his own legal education and because it comes. Rat colon LL, I.O.S.E. to Thomas Pinchbeck in real life. The lawyer has been at the P.I.I.I.V.J. Tilda. That is, THC Porch of St. Paul's Cathedral, where lawyers met their clients for consultation. He has been appointed a judge by patent, that is, by the King's Letters patent making the appointment as well as by plain commission, that is, by a letter addressed to the appointee giving him jurisdiction over all kinds of cases. Widely experienced and well-versed in all the statutes and cases and judgments since the conquest, he won many gifts from his clients. Chaucer's praise of his knowledge and wisdom is somewhat ironic, for the lawyer put on an air of being busier than he actually was. Moreover, by buying a lot of land he aimed at becoming a landed gentleman, his legal expertise helped him to unrestricted possession of property. The Franklin, or free man, usually meant a substantial landholder of fee, but not noble birth. His exact social position is a matter of dispute. For some, he ranked below the gentry and aspired to be included in its ranks. Others put him at par with eleven knights, squires and sergeants of the law. He has certainly held important offices. He .has presided at sessions of the justices of the peace, and has been a member of parliament. 
He has also been a sheriff or an officer next in rank to the Lord Tilde Utenant of the Shire and a contour or special pleader in court. Certainly his dress is indicative of the gentry class. He was a famous epicure taking great delight in food and wine. His bread, ales, wine and meat were of excellent quality, and he also kept fat partridges and coops and fish in private ponds. Changing his diet or menu according to the seasons of the year, the Franklin was above all renowned for his prodigious hospitality. Prologue The five guildsmen are smartly dressed in clothes befitting their station. Since they belonged to different crafts, the fraternity of which they all wore the livery must have been a social and religious guild, a parish guild. The deportment of the men made them veritable burgesses and aldermen, for they had the requisite property in there. The medieval poet wives were equally ambitious. There being I-11 a group suggests an emerging class C or sir. Identity. They are the merchant princes of the future. The cook, Roger of Ware, is a culinary artist who is not exactly likable. This is not merely because he has a sore on Elris' chin, but because the host later accuses him of selling stale, unhygienic and contaminated food. Z Shipman dresses efficiently like the yeoman. He was also master of his craft but thoroughly unscrupulous. Although he was master of a trading ship, Madeleine, he was given to piratical ways and unlawfully attacked other vessels at sea. In his Sultanishes, if he had the upper hand, he drowned his prisoners apparently not an unusual practice at that time. He would tap the wine casks in mid-sea when seasickness had sent them to chant and his men to bed. When the casks would be delivered half-empty, it was the merchant who would suffer. He roved freely from the south low the north, from Spain to Sweden. I. In the portrait of the doctor of physic, philosophy, and science are fused, as they are in medieval intellectual life. Medicine is grounded in astrology. As we have already seen briefly in the first unit, each of the twelve signs of the zodiac was believed low control a different part of the body. The theory of the four humors derives from this. In the portrait of the lawyer, Chaucer showed good knowledge of law. Here he shows an equally good knowledge of medieval medicine. The importance of astrology to medical practice is also dealt with in Chaucer's astrolabe. What was the method followed by the doctor? I.e. watched his patient and chose the astrological hours which would be most favorable to the treatment. He had the skill for taking the auspicious time for making talismanic figures. This was natural magic, a legitimate science, as opposed to black magic or necromancy. The planet Umatvn is the lord of Tuzi ascending sign, and also the moon, must be favorably situated, and the malefic, or harmful, planets must be in positions where their influence would be negligible. The doctor used the theory of humors, which was again touched upon in Unit 1, which cone leads down to the 17th century, to Ben Johnson, for instance. The four elementary qualities or contraries combined in pairs, to produce the four elements. Earth cold and dry, air, hot and moist, water, cold and moist, fire, hot and dry. Similarly the fundamental contraries were held to combine in the four humors. Blood, hot and moist, phlegm, cold and moist, yellow bile, hot and dry, black bile, cold and dry. The list of eminent authorities in medicine cited by Chaucer begins with the legendary Aesculapius. Dioscorides, a Greek writer on medicine, flourished around 50 AD. Rufus of Ephesus lived in the 2nd century. Hippocrates, the founder of Greek medical science, was born about 460 BC. Holly is probably the Persian physician i.e. Ali ibn al Abbas, died in 994. Galen was the famous authority of the 2nd century. Avicenna and Averroes were famous Arabian philosophers and medieval authorities of the 11th and 12th centuries respectively. Serapian seems to refer to three medical writers of the Levant. Razas lived in Baghdad in the 9th and 10th centuries. Damashan is of less certain identification. Constantine, a monk of Kartlitzich, brought Arabian learning to Salerno in the 11th century. The three Othalitals ending the list were all British, living in the latter part of the 13th century and the 14th century. That the doctor read the Bible rarely was not untypical, for doctors, especially plus A followed the Averroist school of opinion, were commonly regarded as skeptical. Not much is said about his dress, but we can make out that he was a stately man of fashion, though Samuel Tilda had over fond of money. C. Levin Osser seems to be ironic and equivocal about the doctor's love of gold when he puns on gold which was used in medicines. 
The irony seems to become sharper as we are told that the doctor has thriftily saved the income he has made from the Black Death. Chaucer further exposes a corrupt nexus between doctors and druggists, apothecaries. The latter were charged with 86 foisting incompetent practitioners WON patients, and doctors act ill the used of causing pound patients to be imposed upon by their particular druggists. But Chaucer describes the N. P. Doctor rather in the manner of the night, as a very perfect practicer we have to be constantly alert about his ironic undertone. Prologue. Chaucer's wife of Bath is easily one of the most arresting figures among the pilgrims. As is often the case, Chaucer mingles literary model with social reality. She is only partly an imitation of the description of La Vie and the Roman de la Rose. Many of her characteristics could be traced back to the fact that she was born when Taurus was in the Ascendant and Mars and Venus in conjunction in that sign of the Zodiac. This accounts for her sexual appetite and refusal to be dominated by men in marriage. She may thus be a successor to an earlier type of the heroic woman, the Anazin located now in the middle-class milieu, where martial qualities were expressed in the domestic world of gender relations. Among her personal traits, which have prompted critics to identify her, are her love of travel, her rather unfashionable dress and equipment, and the fact that she was deaf, and her teeth were set wide apart. Chaucer also gives an accurate statement as to the TF locality of Bath from which she came. Beside Bath doubtless refers to THT suburban parish of St. Michael's Juxta Bathon. Since the reputation of the cloth woven at Bath was not of the best, Chaucer's claim that she surpassed the Dutch weavers of Ypres and Ghent in weaving is ironic. Ypres and Ghent were important centers of the Flemish wool trade and Flemish weavers emigrated to England in Irish numbers in early till the 14th century. It is generally believed that the development of the rural cloth industry was due to Edward 111's invitation to these Flemish weavers. But actually the water power for running fulling mills was largely available in the Cotarlots, the Pelmines, and the Lake District, and by the beginning of the 14th glory the cloth industry started moving to these districts. The unorganized village cloth workers accepted lower wages than their urban counterparts, and their cloth was fairer or cheaper. Like the omen, the wife of Bath is very efficiently and P dash plus Y less than est. On Sundays at home she may wear a ten pound coverage, tilde F, a head covering somewhat like a turban, worn only by the provincial in late fourteenth century England. On the pilgrimage she has put on a very broad hat, and her hair is neatly covered by a wimple worn underneath the hat. She wore a protective skirt about her ample hips to guard against splashes of mud, her hose were tightly and neatly drawn, her shoes were of expensive soft leather and her spurs sharp. The wife took so much pride in her skill in weaving that she demanded first place in making the offering on Sundays, for the order in which parishioners went up to the altar to offer alms and oblations was determined by importance in the community. Such pride was only too common, and the parson specifically preaches against it. The pride is redeemed by boldness, frankness, and vitality in the wife's portrait. Mixing easily in male company, she was skilled in the arts of love, for she knew all the cures of love, which are listed in Ovid's Remedia Amoris. She was a widely experienced plus pilgrim who has been thrice to Jerusalem, to Rome, and to other shrines on the continent. These long pilgrimages were undertaken primarily for pleasure, and as such neither unusual nor inconsistent with her character. They guaranteed safety and won comfort to travelers much in the way modem conducted tours do. But to were condemned for the temptations they offered to vice. The wife was at five husbands. At the church door. The celebration of marriage at church door was common and coined the 10th to the 16th century. The service was in two parts, the marriage proper, and the nuptial mass, celebrated afterward at the altar. The parson's portrait is an idealized one of a good parish priest. It is L- till the old not be taken as alluding to Wycliffe or any of his followers, although it praises the virtues and condemns the abuses that were highlighted by Wycliffeites. The Man of Law's epilogue, however, makes a contemptuous reference to the parson as a lollard. The poet himself was quite close to some of the important patrons of the movement. But not only are there differences, but Chaucer characteristically captures the moving the medieval poet spirit behind reform and humble individual existence, rather than in political unrest. Chaucer the parson's poverty and learning recalls the clerk, and like him his wealth was entirely spiritual. 
Holy and thought and work, he was devoted to his pastoral responsibilities. Although he could impose the penalty of excommunication for the non-payment of tithes, 10% tax levied by the church on every parishioner, he would not condemn the poor for being foreignly unable to pay the tax. But since it was his duty to collect the tithes, he would make up the deficit out of his own meager resources including the voluntary contributions which belonged to him by right. Benign, patient and diligent, he took no idle pleasures. Even if he was ill, he would visit on foot, in all kinds of weather, his parish members irrespective of rank or wealth, or the distance of their dwellings. Above all, unlike a large number of the religious functionaries, he practiced what he preached, and set an example himself as a priest in charge of his flock, before asking others to follow it. For he knew very well, that he controlled the moral lives of his parish members, and if he was corrupt or unclean, what would happen to them? He was totally free from the impulse to acquisitiveness and power which provided the psychological basis for capitalism, and which was magnified by the new money economy. Other priests often deserted their parishioners to run off to London for better paid, and more comfortable offices. There he could have sung mass daily for the repose of a soul, chantry, or he could have been retitled to ed, or engaged for service by a guild, to act as their chaplain. But he remains in the village. He was neither severe nor arrogant to sinners but always merciful, provided of course they were repentant. For he would not spare the unrepentant, again irrespective of rank or wealth. His uncomplicated honesty contrasts subtly with the over-fastidious conscience of the prioress, and in his humility he demanded no reverence from his flock. The plowman is another idealized figure, a fitting brother to the parson. He was a small tenant farmer, or a holder of Lama's lands, village lands let out from year to year. Neither hostile to nor fearful of the upper classes, he is a true representative of rustic life. He exemplifies the dignity of labor. He carried loads of dung, knew how to thresh, to dig and to make ditches. The contemporary books on husbandry emphasized the same duties and Langland's peers plowmen performed them as well. Dressed in the unfashionable tabard, a loose tunic without sleeves, which corresponds to a kind of laborer's smock, he led his life in perfect charity, unruffled by pleasure and pain, loving God and his neighbors. No wonder he was always willing to labor for any poor peasant in difficulty without any payment. The miller's clothes are obviously not important. What is striking in the portrait is his massive physical strength. His physical characteristics were regularly associated by physiognomists with the kind of nature he is shown to have. His short-shouldered, stocky figure, his fat face with red bushy beard, his flat nose with a wart on top these variously denoted a shameless, talkative, quarrelsome, and lecherous disposition. Chaucer may not have actually consulted the learned sources for these ideas as they had become quite familiar. Able to heave a door out of its hinges, or break it with his sea head, the miller's wart with its tuft of hair, his blackened flaring nostrils and huge mouth all indicate a kind of coarseness that reminds us of Fablio. No wonder he was a loud, scurrilous talker and ribald jester. A miler in the Middle Ages possessed an important monopoly, for all the peasants under the lord of a manor were obliged to take their grain to the miller of the estate on which they lived. The miller's rate for grinding was fixed by law, but since his was the only mill he could easily, like Chaucer's Robin, overcharge and steal some of the grain as well. The manciple was a servant who purchased provisions for a college or an inn of court. The temple referred to in Chaucer's text would have not been the inner or middle temple near the Strand, both of which were occupied in Chaucer's time by societies of lawyers. Like the miller, he was also a cheat and his deceptive powers are ironically described as wisdom. Chaucer the poet finds it astonishing that, whether he bought the provisions by payment or on credit, the tally was a stick on which the amount of a debt was recorded by notches. The learned lawyers were no match for his craftiness. These extremely capable lawyers were easily fooled by the ignorant manciple. The Reeve is a perfect companion and competitor of the miller, especially in matters of devious dealing. What was the exact office of the Reeve? The chief manager of an estate, under the lord of the manor, was the steward, or seneschal. Below him was the bailiff, and below the bailiff was the provost, who was elected by the peasants, and had immediate care of the stock and grain. Normally the reeve was subordinate to the bailiff, but these titles were not rigidly fixed and oswald. Chaucer's reeve seemed superior to a bailiff, and even performed some of the steward's duties. 
Chaucer represents him as dealing directly with his lord, ruling under bailiffs and hinds, outwitting auditors, and accumulating property. The medieval reeve was a natural rival to the miller on an estate, since they competed with each other in cheating the peasants. This is why they quarrel, and the crafty reeve rides the farthest away from the miller. As an overseer or manager, the reeve's duty was to inspect everything on the estate regularly, to buy needed supplies, and to impose fines on the workers if necessary. H.E. knew all about the storage of grain, when to sow, and when to reap, about the condition of his lord's livestock and poultry, and he was an expert in keeping accounts. As indicated in passing in Unit 1, the lord of the man was probably an absentee landlord, making the reeve all-powerful. This is why his dishonesty and cunning make him such a terror to the peasants. He was so clever that without showing any arrears or losses he was able to become rich at his lord's expense. A house and a robe at the cost of the lord were nothing unusual. In fact, he could please his lord by lending him some of the lord's own possessions and obtain thanks and rewards in the bargain. I.I.S. Klaselikrupt head, coat and rusty blade indicate his inferior social position. A slender chileric man with long, thin, calfless legs, his physiognomy denotes sharpness of wit, irascibility, and wantonness. The reference to his handsome Norfolk dwelly tilde it suggests a real-life figure. What the miller obtained by loud, outrageous stealing, the reeve acquired by meanness, severity, and manipulation dot of accounts. If the miller and reeve are fellow rascals, they do not have on us the unpleasant and repulsive effect of the partners in viciousness, the summoner and the partner. The summoner, or apparitor, was an officer who cited delinquents to appear before the ecclesiastical court. Such officials, and even the archdeacon were cormed. Some scholars believe that Chaucer's portrait of the summoner is more unfavorable than historical records seem to warrant, but Chaucer was following literary tradition. The very first physiognomical detail is unsavory, and Chaucer's comparison of his diseased, fiery face full of eruptions with the cherubs is caustic in its irony. The summoner actually suffers from a kind of leprosy, a kind of skin disease brought on by uncontrolled lechery. His scabby brows and scanty beard made children afraid of him. All known reticines have been used mercury, lead compounds, sulfur, borax, and oil of tartar but no ointment has cleansed his white blotches and pimples and knobs on his face. His incurable, revolting disease is a picture of his soul. Chaucer's medical knowledge further told him that the summoner should not eat garlic, onions and leeks or drink strong red wine. In his drunken state he has set a huge garland on his head and carries a flat loaf of bread as a shield. Some scholars think that he was meant to represent a debauched Bacchus. Given his profession, it is not surprising that he had picked up like a parrot a few terms in Latin which he would boastfully repeat when he got drunk. But if anyone should question him further, then his ignorance would be exposed, although he tried to wriggle out by parroting a legal formula. If the summoner found anywhere some rascal in sin, he would encourage him not to fear the excommunicating curse of the archdeacon since money would set everything right. Chaucer is perhaps ironic in stating that the curse was worth exactly prologue. I. One I the tilde tilde di tilde 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 el poet as much as his assoiling of the soul. A soiling means either canonical absolution, chatterser that is, the removal of the sentence of excantilder nunication, or the ordinary sacramental absolution. But Chaucer is not really being a heretic or a wycliffite. He simply condemns the abuses of an avaricious clergy. The significance of it refers to the opening IR words of a writ remanding an excantilder communicated person to prison. The summoner's portrait becomes sinister when we discover his entilde manipulation of the private lives of people around him. He would happily excuse a man for keeping a concubine, a practice commoning on the celibate priests, for a year if he was paid only a quart of wine. He then indulged in the same sin himself. Being sexually immoral, he probably came to know the unsavory secrets of other people's lives. Perhaps this is why he was able to hold the young men and women at his mercy, under his control. He knew their secrets, and acted as their counsel. Perhaps he exploited them as informers against their elders. Pardoners, or quasters, were sellers of papal indulgences. Many were forbidden to preach, and some were even laymen. Many traveling pardoners were wholly unauthorized, and the tricks and abuses they practiced were denounced by the church. Perhaps the character of all semblant in Roman Tyler Rose gave Chaucer the idea of the pardoner's confession before his tale. 
friend and fitting companion to the summoner, the pardoner similarly abused his calling. The literature of complaint is much more severe in its censure of pardoners, because dealing largely with the helpless and ignorant poor, they did greater harm to the soul than the summoners. The system of papal indulgences grew from the fact that medieval men, after proper confession and repentance, gave money to the church for good deeds, to be performed in their name that was believed to guarantee some reduction of time and purgatory, and hasten the progress to paradise. The pardoners sold indulgences, but often they did not insist on confession and repentance, moreover they tended to pocket the money given to the church in exchange for pardons. In order to sell pardons more effectively, the 14th century pardoners sold saints, relics and cultivated the art of preaching. These relics, as we see in the case Tilda F. Chaucer's pardoner, were no relics at all, but bones and rags. The song of the pardoner and the summoner's vocal support seemed to insinuate an unhealthy relationship between the two. That he was of Tilda Obseval is significant, since the Order of St. Mary Roncival in London was involved in public scandals concerning the sale of pardons. Chaucer comically describes the pardoner officially arrived from Rome with his collection of so-called relics. Among these are a pillowcase, claimed to be part of Our Lady's Veil, piece of cloth, exhibited as part of THC sale of St. Peter's boat, a Latin J cross and some fixed bones. With these spurious relics he cheated the parson and his poor parishioners, receiving more money in one day by his preaching than the priest did in two months. His eloquent preaching in the church pulpit made him a greater danger since the congregation was moved by the discourse to make generous offerings to the preacher. Like the summoner, he was not distinguished by his dress. He did not wear his hood, because he thought it was the latest fashion to wear only a cap on which he had sewed a vernicle. A miniature copy of the handkerchief of St. Veronica was thought to have given to Christ on the way to his crucifixion. His physical characteristics are repellent. He had a goat's voice, he was beardless, and his yellow hair fell in thin strips over his shoulders. The details cumulatively lead to the assertion that he was a gelding or a mare, an emasculated eunuch. He leaves behind a sense of unhealthiness. 5.4 The Concluding Section of the Prologue After this portrait gallery, Chaucer returns to the Tabard Inn, where the pilgrims had assembled. But before he proceeds further, he attempts an aesthetic defense of the coarseness of his bow Tilda Tilda Joyce's style. He has been guided by realistic truth and moral honesty. The defense is similar to those offered by Jean de Mune and by Boccaccio. He finds divine support in the honest speech of the Bible and Plato's Tinius 29b provides the source for the close relationship between form and content. We are moved on to a hearty supper presided over by the host, Haney Bailey. His hospitality and manly gaiety dispel the effect of the pardoner's portrait. In his characteristic playful spirit he suggests after supper that the pilgrims, in order to lighten the boredom of the long journey on horseback, tell two stories canterbury and two homeward. The host will be the master of ceremonies, and decides to accompany the pilgrims. As the judge, he promises the best storyteller a supper on return, paid for by the pilgrims. Everyone agrees happily to the host's proposal, and there is already a sense of community among the heterogeneous company. A distance out of London, by a brook at the second milestone on the Kent Road, the host invites the pilgrims to draw lots. Whether by chance or by plan, the lot falls on the knight who begins the game with pleasure. Apart from the brief portrait of the host, there is also the persona of Chaucer the narrator. Although his two tales give him a clearer shape later, already the somewhat detached, ironic, self-deprecating bourgeois figure is discernible. He is a little in awe perhaps of the knight and the prioress, familiar and unsentimental about the rising bourgeois figures, deeply respectful about the humble, devout and unworldly characters and bitingly satiric about the corrupt and the vicious. As he constructs this persona of the narrator, he asks forgiveness for any disruption of degree or hierarchy in his succession of portraits, because he does not have a strong intellect. 5.5 Let US Sum LTP and this unit detailed annotation of the prologue has been provided, so that apart from Chaucer's skill in characterization you may also grasp the larger social and intellectual issues, and of course the comic strategies involved. 5.6 Exercises 1. Why does the pilgrimage and the poem begin in spring? C3.2 2. 
On the basis of the annotations, attempt an analysis of the portraits of the prioress, the monk, the friar, the wife of Bath, the parson, the plowman, the clerk, the miller, the reeve, the pardoner, the summoner. This is only for practice. 3. Bring out the different shades in Chaucer's irony. Broad and subtle irony. 4. What individualizes the portraits? 5. What makes them typical? The individual elements may include physiognomy, dress, eccentricity, but dress and physiognomy are also representative of class or social group. Actually, there is no opposition. Perhaps individuality ultimately comes from Chaucer's vividness of imagination. Prologue.